Hey, welcome, everybody, to the Customer Success Leadership Roundtable. I'm Andrew Marks, co-founder and chief product officer for Success Coaching. Uh, and uh, I'm thrilled to be leading this uh, this uh, this discussion today. Uh, this free learning event is brought to you by Success Coaching, where we've empowered over 36,000 students from nearly 100 countries with our globally acclaimed customer team focused professional development programs, whether it's self paced online learning or dynamic virtual boot camps. We've got a program that suits your team's unique needs. Whether the role is customer success, customer support, customer service, having a mindset focused on helping your customers achieve a return on their investment with your organization is paramount. You can find all the details of our offerings on our website, successcoaching.co, or in the chat where Ashley will provide links, or she has provided links, thanks Ashley, uh, to any coupon codes that we're offering. For newcomers, this is where real-world advice meets practicality. We invite industry experts to share their experiences, ensuring our discussions remain grounded in everyday challenges of customer success. Regardless of the company that you work for, the scope of your role, or the size of the customers your teams deal with, we aim to pick topics that are going to be practical and useful to you. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get going. This webinar is recorded, and we'll be posting a replay and transcript on our website early next week. We encourage active participation, so please feel free to ask your questions using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your Zoom interface. Now, questions with higher upvotes will receive priority during the Q&A session. And for our LinkedIn Live audience, you can also post your questions directly and they will be relayed to us. Thank you, Santana. To maintain a smooth discussion, please use the chat window exclusively for commentary while directing your questions to the Q&A window. Once again, thank you for your engagement. In the world of customer success, you'll find plenty of smart ideas and theories, but in this series, we're all about getting real. We're here to talk practical advice, tried and true tricks, and stories from folks who live and breathe customer success every single day. That's why we've got three amazing panelists with us today. These are people who really know their stuff, and we can't wait to hear what they've got to say. So without any more delay, let's kick things off by having our panelists introduce themselves to y'all and tell us a bit about who they are and what they do. And let's get started as usual in alphabetical order with Josh. Yeah, uh, first name alphabetical, not last name because- First uh, name alphabetical, which yeah. puts you in a unique position it, of not it's being It's so last, weird. I know, right? it's, the, it's the, the best reason why I joined these panels. Is that the only reason why uh, that's, you show that's up here? The, is because the you don't reason. have to be yeah. last. Exactly. Uh, Josh Zamora, I am based in San Diego. I am director of global customer success at Hostaway and starting my third week here, uh, really enjoying it. I, I get to do the stuff that I've always wanted to do, right? Leading teams, helping customers be successful, helping my teams be successful. I've been in CS for about 14 years now and um, have moved from being an individual contributor to manager to director, uh, leading teams, growing teams, uh, establishing teams, and it's all a wonderful experience. Now moved into employee success is kind of the way I look at it. Um, and a little bit personally, I am based in San Diego, married, two kids, uh, have a dog and two cats and a partridge in a pear tree. So uh, glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me again, Andrew. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And they are lucky to have you, man. Uh, congrats on the, on the new gig. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Um, Judith, you're up. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Judith. I am head of customer success at Architecture. It is a data analytics company. Before I was at Architecture, I was, and I've been there for almost three years now as head of customer success. Before I was there, I was at Tableau as a sales manager and one of the things that brought me over to the customer success side of things is it didn't feel good when you sold stuff to a customer, thought you'd get a bunch of add-ons and expansions, and they never even took it off the shelf. So I wanted to find a way to really help customers uh, realize the dream that they were sold, and that brought me over to, to architecture, which I've had a great time building up that team, building out the processes as we start to, to build out our customer success department. Um, personally, I just got engaged, uh, two weeks ago. So that's very exciting. Um, and I am located in Washington, DC and we have one cat who is sleeping next to me, but she might make an appearance. We will see. Awesome. Congratulations on the, you didn't even yeah. mention that on Monday. That's awesome. Good for you. And how does it feel to be on the light side? The uh, the dark yeah, side it, you? It's very hard to deliver the dream, but we do our best every day. So 
And awesome. sales, it seems so easy. Oh yeah. Piece of cake. Well, yeah, it's easy when you don't care about the, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you don't care what, I'm just going to toss it over to you. You figure it out. <laughs> I, that's never happened before, has it? Uh, awesome. Thanks, Judith. And last but not least, Mikhail. Thank you. And congratulations, Judith. Uh, so Mikhail Bergman, I lead our customer success and customer support teams at Griffin AI. And I've been in customer success for about 10, uh, I was going to say 10 teams. That might be true too. 10 years, um, led a variety of different teams, built a customer success department for a startup that was, has been very successful so far. And ultimately, I enjoy building partnerships throughout the organization. Let's grease the wheels so we can get work done more quickly, more easily, and help our teams, help our customers. So really excited for this panel. Thank you very much for having me today. Excited to meet everybody. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that, no, that's uh, you, you're you're uh, you're in the right place. To talk about that. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about that today. So once again, thank you all for being here today. Let's get to our topic at hand. So let's be honest. Cross-functional collaboration is more myth than reality in most organizations. How many of us have sat through meetings filled with buzzwords like synergy and teamwork only to retreat to our departmental silos and continue doing business as usual? Right? We preach collaboration. But in practice, we're often oblivious to what other teams are doing. And this disconnect isn't just a minor inconvenience. It's costing us customers, tarnishing our reputation, and hitting our bottom line. Picture this, a classic and often repeated scene that nobody here has ever heard of. A customer signs on the dotted line, excited about the promises made by the sales team, but when they show up for their first kickoff call. They're met with a customer success team that seems to be hearing about their needs for the first time. In that moment, the seeds of doubt are planted, and that can completely undermine the entire customer relationship at the worst possible time. And the hard truth is, in today's business world, exceptional customer experiences demand uh, almost a, a synchronized effort across the entire organization. When product development understands customer pain points, when marketing aligns or messaging with actual customer experiences and sales sets realistic expectations, we create this seamless journey for our customers. But achieving that, that level of collaboration isn't without its challenges. Silos, misaligned goals, and communication barriers often stand in our way. So fostering true cross-functional collaboration isn't about feel-good team building exercises, an additional Slack channel, or another project management tool. It requires a fundamental shift in how we think, how we operate, how we communicate, how we measure success across our entire organization. The days of the customer-facing teams being solely responsible for customer success are long gone. Every department plays a critical role in the customer journey. So today we're going to discuss why traditional approaches to collaboration often fall short and explore what it really takes to break down those stubborn silos. Our goal is for all of you to walk away with actionable strategies that go beyond lip service to create meaningful, impactful collaboration. So let's start with at least what I consider a provocative uh, question for our panelists. What's the biggest lie? that organizations tell themselves about cross-functional collaboration and how do we start dismantling it? Yeah, I, I think I'll jump in on this one, uh, Andrew. So you go right I ahead. Think the, the biggest lie that I have always heard is that it's automagic, right? That it's just going to happen because A, we're all professionals here. B, we all know what we're supposed to be doing. C, we all have the same goal in mind. And, and the reality is, is that we don't. Like oftentimes you're going into an organization, uh, like I am, three, three weeks in, right? And I have to learn not just what we're trying to build as a business, but what everyone's individual goals are. And discovering that is a process in of itself. So collaboration doesn't magically happen. It's something that has to be intentionally designed. Yeah, and I would I would piggyback off of that, that a lot of times we can set in the process or the structure like, hey, we have reoccurring meetings on the calendar and we do those on a monthly basis. So that should probably help everyone understand what's going on and we can just move on. Um, but I think one of the, the words that you used was impactful or intentional approach. There's something more to just getting something on the books to 
discuss things, but then actually strategically aligning is a whole different conversation. So I've seen a lot of let's check the box and say that we're meeting regularly and therefore we're cross collaborating, but it goes so much deeper and wider than that and needs to be more intentional than it just happens automatically when you schedule meetings together and you meet as professionals. I think I would agree with everyone here. Intentionality is the keyword. Uh, we've all been, we've all seen the memes, right? That's a meeting that could have been an email. Um, oh, that was a bunch of time wasted in Slack or in teams going in circles. We've experienced that. So just because we try to collaborate doesn't mean we are truly collaborating. We have to be thinking through one another's perspectives and what's the best way to collaborate for that given topic or time or setting or framework. Uh, I think you, I think you touched on something really important there, Mikhail. Something I was going to jump in on is other people's perspectives. We need to have the mindset. We need to have the so so. I look at meetings, and, and quite frankly, I, I actually coach people all the time. I'm like, you need to cancel meetings if you don't think they're going to be a value mm-hmm. to you. So, meetings are a vessel. Meetings are a tactic, right? But at the end of the day, it's I've got I've got to have this. The, I've, I as a leader and my team need to have this mindset of of cross-functional collaboration of the importance of it. And what's funny about it is a lot of the skills and the perspective and that mindset are already apparent. We're already exercising those things. If we're doing customer success well with our customers. Yeah. Right. And if I can add to this a little bit, right, there's, there's a different perspective and Mikhail, you kind of touched on it uh, to Andrew's point, right? It's, the perspective of a leader changes as you move up in the organization. And especially in a leadership role, I'm no longer just focusing on what my team can do and what my role is supposed to be doing in the business. Now I need to figure out what is marketing doing and how am I impacting that? What is support doing and how am I impacting that? What is professional services doing and what are the things that maybe I can make their job easier with? There's there's no no one lives in a vacuum in customer success anymore because it becomes part of the philosophy of the overall business. And as a result, collaboration is something that you have to think about and do intentionally before you actually get into a meeting. Uh, So it starts before you get into meetings. It starts before the emails. It starts before the phone calls. It's something that you have to think about as a leader coming into an organization. Well, you have to wake up every morning with that, with that mindset. I want to jump in there on that too. Really excellent points about the mindset. Uh, but you touched on something briefly that our teams have to have that mindset. And that as we go from an individual contributor where most of us start our careers and work to whatever we want to be, a leader, a senior individual contributor, et cetera, that as that goes up the ladder or as we broaden our impact on the organization, we start to better be positioned to understand the longstanding challenges that exist at our organization. Nine times out of 10, they are related to collaboration and miscommunication or a lack of structure or lack of preparation for meetings and so on. So it's really key that as we grow in our leadership capacity and as we help our teams help solve these challenges, that we teach them to understand one another's perspectives. So perspective is key and understanding that every department is customer success. Every department affects one another. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I think... So, I'm sorry. sorry, go ahead, Judith. I was just going to say, I think that perspective piece is key. Because when you're in a more leadership role, you by default get that perspective because you have a lot more exposure to all of those conversations, to things that your team is actually siloed from. So it's very easy for your team to not have that perspective because they are not exposed to, oh, like this team is extremely behind. I have all of the context because I'm getting the updates from that leader. And so part of that is, your opportunity to say, hey, here's what's going on across the business that I've been hearing that you need to be aware of, that we need to discuss, just so that you can go into conversations with other departments with that perspective that you uniquely have that your team doesn't, because your team by default is siloed. They're with the customers. They're talking a lot with them. They're not seeing what else might be going on in the business that you're able to see as a leader. I, well, I, I, I not only use that with my my direct reports when I would meet with them on a weekly basis, but when I would I would do monthly all hands meetings with my entire team. And I mean, there were certain things that I could not share with them, of course, mm-hmm. at, a, at, 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 you know, at a leadership level. But I felt it was really important to explain here's where things are at and here's the way I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Right. It's the best way to keep them in the loop but also get them all on the bus. 
right? Also solicit, I would meet with my team on a weekly basis to solicit ideas. Hey, we got this situation. What do you think? Yeah. Because I'm not going to, last thing I want to do is sit in, you know, my, my office and try and figure all this stuff out on my own. There's a mutual accountability component to all of this, right? Yeah. Is I am accountable, not just to my team and my department, but I'm accountable to the departments that, the, that rely on me. And I think what ends up happening a lot of times is that when we create those silos and we're, we're kind of built veering into silos and miscommunication a little bit. But when we do that, um, we're, we've all been on the, on the back end of that experience, right? So how many times have you been at a company where sales isn't hitting their number? So therefore CS gets cut or marketing isn't hitting their targets and therefore, you know, something else happens, right? There's, there's impacts to every decision that we're making. And part of this collaboration building that we're doing is really about culture building, um, it's really about creating the, the structure in which we communicate to each other. And if I can be so bold as to talk about one of the questions in the Q and a Andrew, uh, well, Steve. I actually let's, let's go down the, cause one of the, one of yeah. the questions around, uh, one of our next questions is actually about culture. Yeah. Right. Is, 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 uh, you know, cause you've got all these organizations that claim to be customer centric yet these, you, these departments work in silos. So how do you break yeah. down those those walls and create, you know, a truly customer focused culture across all the teams. Yeah. I'll, I'll raise my hand for this one. Um, okay. So we've done some interesting things in the past. So as full context, I was a teacher before joining customer success. So often I approach things with a teaching, educational, um, pedagogy kind of background or instructional design. So an exercise I did pre COVID. So pre the virtual days, a little bit more challenging nowadays. Um, something that we wanted to focus on was building that perspective and that empathy for one another, for each department and for the role. So imagine you are leading a team of CSMs and your CSMs in a team meeting one day tell you that the PMs never listen to them. I'm sure if you raised your hand, most people would raise a hand. So we did an exercise uh, where we got the CSMs in a room and we had them write down on a whiteboard what the PMs do all day from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then vice versa, have the PMs write down on a whiteboard what the CSMs do all day from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And what the day in the life looks like and what those key challenges were. And then had sections for the things that stress them out, the things that are easy, et cetera. It was very fascinating to see the misconceptions that each department simply has about one another. Just because if we don't put in the intentional time to learn, we just assume and we move on with our jobs. So I'll leave there. It sounds like people are nodding and might want to chime in. I I just love that approach. Um, I think it's very easy to assume um, what a different person is doing throughout the day based off of title, based off of job responsibility, yeah. based off of where they pop up in your world. Um, but there are so many other places that we are. I mean, CSM can be looked at as the gap fillers. So we're popping up randomly. And then there's also customer conversations and QBRs and all of the day to day. So I think it's um, it's that's something I want to try because it is something I've been thinking about as far as if you're not talking directly and really understanding someone's day to day, then then you're not going to be able to be effective if you're communicating that something needs to change because yep. you're not looking at it within the context of the entire role and responsibility that that. And once again, this isn't something that should be foreign to anybody in a customer success role, because we're doing this, mm -hmm. but we should be doing it with our own customers. Yep. Right. Except with our own customers, once you, you, you work with enough customers, you begin to understand, Hey, you know, this role typically sees X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to be validating. And in this case, it's help me understand. I mean, you're, you're, you're flat out coming out and saying, help me understand what you do and what you care about and how are you measured and right yeah. all once again all of the thing how do you define success all of the things that we're doing with our customers um, josh what yeah. do you got to add so i there's I, i'm looking at something up because there's a um there's a rule right we all know the golden rule treat everyone how you want to be treated um and I, I've read through this a few times, but there's a platinum rule. I don't know if you guys have heard of the platinum rule before. Um, and that is that we should treat people the way that they want to be treated, right? Not just the way that I would envision I would want to be treated, but how do 
they want to be treated. And that implies that you are taking the time to learn who they are, what their ambitions are, what their goals are, what are their initiatives, where are their stressors to Mikhail's port, uh, point of like trying to figure out what this other department does. As leaders, we need to operate by the platinum rule more than we do the golden rule because the golden rule can be very selfish and self-centered, whereas the platinum rule takes the the perspective of the other before we take action. I think we have to follow both rules. We do. The course. platinum rule and the gold rule. I mean, the platinum rule is all, all about meeting the customer or meeting the person, meeting the customer or meeting your peer where they're at. Yep. Right? Yep, yep. So anybody have an example where the big lie about cross-functional collaboration um, caused a significant customer experience failure? Where the big lie is that it's just magical and it automatically yeah. happens because yeah. we all showed up to work today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I don't know if it caused, you know, one other, I guess, to go off on a small tangent, when you're working cross-functionally, it's very, very rare that I'm able to say, hey, guys, we don't do this this way. We lose that customer. So to be able to say, you know, um, this lie led to a huge significant event is tough because it's all, it's the combination of all of these things. I like to say it's like little paper cuts that then lead to, to bleeding out. Um, but one example I have of some changes that we've made is we had a, a product po process where you're, we're meeting with the product manager. We're talking about the things that we want to see. We're evaluating, scoring them, weighting them. You know, we're doing the thing to help get their feedback heard. But I, to that point, I couldn't say, if we don't do this, we're losing a bunch of customers, you know? And it, so it might not trump, hey, if we do do this, we're gonna win eight new customers, right? So we created a new lane after having those conversations and me just realizing that I wasn't able to really compete with the measurements that we had. So we needed to have a new measurement and we created a lane called quick wins. And this is, this is probably something that a lot of you guys have done already with product where it's a small change. It's not going to make a huge impactful decision, you know, like that will win a renewal or that will get an upsell in general, but it's going to incrementally improve the customer experience. And with every product sprint, we have a certain amount of time dedicated to those quick wins. But we that. were going through the motions, I guess, to your point, the big lie that we're talking with product we're writing things out, we're discussing, we all agree, but at the end of the day, what happens to the customer experience? Well, that never gets prioritized. So then we kind of zoomed out and created a different lane that has been really effective to get some of those small things done that I might've heard about nine months finally actually get done, which was just a big win and show the customer that we do listen. I'll, I'll add something here, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, another story here. I think it's a, it's a complicated, question to answer in some ways, because I, I want to think of the biggest, baddest failure that I've ever experienced. But then I'm like, oh, wait, I don't want to share what that was. <laughs> right? Um, but I think if we think through both our big failures, the implementation that went wrong, the feature that flopped, the renewal that didn't happen because we missed doing certain things, etc. If we use something like five whys and we break them down and work backward, almost always somewhere in the middle there, there's the, well, so-and-so sent a message, but I read it wrong. And I thought it meant this. So it was lacking in detail. And so X, Y, Z, and things continue. I think a lot of the inefficiencies we find in our own organizations are also related to collaboration. And sometimes collaboration really just means putting the right people in the room, not overcrowding the room, bringing the right people to the table. But even then, the most critical part, I think, is often having enough perspective-taking, empathy, and specificity. So where this story is going is when we can do the opposite and we can teach our CSMs to have that specificity and to have that perspective taking and empathy, amazing things happen. The best initiatives we've ever had have usually come grassroots, at least as an idea, for the CSMs were contributing enough clarity that they could help everybody pull together around this concept and bring out something new. So I would say that. Um, on that side, go ahead. Love that. That specificity is super important. Just winging it, just figuring it out is just, hey, yeah, you might be, you might get lucky, yeah. but 
it 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 usually leads to uh usually leads to bad things. I I would just jump in and say getting the right people in the room. Yeah. Um my last company was Tableau, so he huge ish, right? Um, we were, and it was bought by Salesforce. So it got bigger. Um, it was actually a lot easier to get the right people in the room for that versus going to a small co- company where everyone's wearing like eight different hats and I'm just trying to figure something out. So I invite 10 people to the meeting and I'm like, I'm sure one of these people can help me out. And it just ends up causing a lot more confusion. So I think, um, part of the, the effort there is I think from a culture and strategy perspective, of really saying who is the sole owner of this process um, and getting alignment from your strategic leadership team all the way down to you so that when you have an issue, you're not inviting everyone that could possibly be involved with that, but you're inviting the one person so you can have a very specific, productive conversation about the things that they are the sole owner for. Um, And so that's something that you learn over time, but then after you learn it, it's good to get that feedback from the strategic leadership team or whoever is helping you navigate that these are the right people. These are their KPIs. Here's how you need to start to involve them. By the way, just a reminder, we're going to start uh, taking your questions here in about uh, 10 minutes. So if you have any questions or you see something in that list that you want to upvote, that you want to hear an answer to, uh, hit that uh, thumbs up button. Um, so in a lot of organizations, there, there are these gaps. Right. There are these gaps between, for example, sales, sales and so what sales can promise and what customer success can deliver uh, between uh, what's happening in support and customer success, who's actually on the front line, what product is building and customer success, who ends up having the most face time with the customer and understands their use cases and things like that uh, between who marketing is, you know, marketing's vision of what the ideal customer profile is and who they're marketing to versus what customer success, success actually seeing out in the field and how things are evolving. Right. So, so how, how have you kind of successfully bridged that gap in your own organization to ensure, for example, that sales handoff information reaches customer success teams effectively? What are, what are some of the things that need to be done in order to be most effective with, with those uh, departments? I I mean, we're going to fall back on some of the same stuff that we've been talking about for a little bit. Right. But having that intentional meeting with the right people to talk through, this is what we want to accomplish, right? So one example, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm three weeks into this new company, um, got called into a meeting to talk about the sales to onboarding transition, and then the onboarding to CS transition. And one of the problems that we've had here up, up until I've, I've arrived has been that transition process has been very nebulous. Right, we we've got so many people wearing so many hats, and we got to get things done fast. We got to get things done um, quickly, and efficiency is kind of overlooked, and excellence in its own way is kind of overlooked. So, one of the things that that I'm discovering, and one of the things that I'm working through, is like, who do we need to get into the room that's going to be able to make a, a a key decision about what we're going to do, right? What are the specifics that we can minimize so that we're not adding more churn into the overall process? Um, it can be really easy to over-engineer things. Simple does not mean lack of excellence. Uh, simplicity is actually one of the best ways to streamline all these processes. Um, and making things simple, making making sure we have the right person in the room, and making sure that we are um, addressing things in a timely fashion, those are the ways that we can actually make the processes work better between the different departments. Um, a lot of times we look at big companies or we come from bigger companies and we're like, oh yeah, that's what worked over there. And then we forget about the fact that we're in a completely different environment with completely different people, with completely different, different business processes. And we try to recreate something that's never going to fit here. So having that adaptability, the flexibility to say, I'm going to make something work here at this company for this purpose and do it in, in an efficient manner is, is a key component of that. I have a question for you. I got a yeah. follow-up question for you, Josh. Do every one of your meetings, especially those with um, folks outside of your silo, mm-hmm. uh, uh, is there an agenda and is there a purpose attached to that meeting? That is my goal. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> that is my goal. And it's actually something that I'm trying to change uh, from a culture perspective. Uh, I actually had this conversation with one of my CSMs, uh, not just in the last week or so. Like, what is this meeting? Why, why am I attending this? Why am I participating in this? 
And that is the thing that I'm trying to build into all the meetings. It's a lesson I learned from my service nowadays, right? When you have a 22,000 employee company, everyone's got some sort of thing that they're working on. Why are we asking for their time? So it's going to be an important part of the culture build out for collaboration to work effectively. I'll add in there. I, oh, go, ahead, ahead. Sorry. Sorry. go ahead, Judith. I was going to say I have a counterpoint to that a little bit with my mm -hmm. organization, whereas um, it's kind of like this give and take. So if we're going in and saying, hey, we need product to do X, Y, and Z, um, and and they're adding us to meetings, it's very easy. And I had a new person join me. What is this sprint review, you know, thing? And I was like, you know what? We join one of us. We can have a representative, but one of us needs to join to show that we're aligned with this team and that we care about the key metric and we're here to give feedback rather than after the fact, two months later, we're like, hey, that didn't actually meet our needs. And they're like, well, right. you never showed up to any of these meetings. And sometimes we're not really needed but there's a little bit of a give and take there where we have to show up to show we're invested in the same things that we're talking about. Um, and I know that's a sensitive topic because we are all overburdened by meetings, but I do think that when we're giving feedback, uh, sometimes we just need to show up if there's confusion, especially in a virtual world where typically they could go and tap on someone's shoulder and, hey, what does this look like? But in this case, we just show up to make sure that nothing is missed. But that's also not like, cross collaboration at work that is just the management of a yeah. product so I, i'd kind say of like that a different tactic there yeah i, know, I think that's a little though. different than what i was referring to because that's that's a standing meeting and you know that's one of those things okay somebody's got to show up to we so we know what the hell's going on right yeah. mm -hmm. so we yeah. can stay but, in the loop and i think there's also a component of racy involved with that right yeah. Yeah. um because yeah. if we don't have some idea of what you're responsible for, accountable for, consulted, informed about, like you're, that's a lack of communication at that point in time that is just as unhealthy as unnecessary meetings. So we we need to incorporate that into the overall culture of the meeting process, just as much as we need to incorporate agendas and simple things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to, I'll add one more thing here. I love all these thoughts tying this together because the theme to me there becomes preparation. Right is and there's some questions in the chat. I'm not going to answer them directly, but tying a few little things together, as we build out our customer success team members, we should be challenging them to learn how to communicate clearly, and to learn how to write a project, or to learn how to write down a really good problem statement for a product enhancement request, or to learn how to write an agenda, or to learn to be consistent in their their meeting tiles. Each of those little pieces of communication builds on one another. And it not only facilitates good collaboration, it helps people show up to meetings prepared. It helps them know why they should show up to meetings, helps you find things two months later when you're trying to track them down. Um, but it also positions our customer success management teams as being not only experts to our customers because they come across professional and polished, but to our internal team members as well, where there's no reason that any department should be hesitant to work with a CSM. Because they do it so well. Yep. I love that. Um, yeah, me too. Um, so important. We need to be, we need to give them a reason to go, hey, mm -hmm. you know what they're talking about? They sound pretty good. We should use them for selling. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to know their shit. I left that world for a reason. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, so, we're going to, we got about, uh, what do we got? We got eight questions. So uh, before we turn to, to answering some questions from the audience, one last question I've got for you all. You know, we, we, we often hear about aligning goals across departments, but in your experience, you know, what's the most effective way to actually make that alignment happen, especially when departments have conflicting priorities? I love this question. I think it's okay to have two conflicting goals. Um, at the same time, because both of them provide value and both of them can get distinct support. So I think some examples can be cost cutting a uh, goal might be something on product and that's not something on CS, it's adoption. But both of them have that same overall business perspective of we need to grow revenue as much as possible and make it less expensive to do so. 
And how do you grow revenue if revenue is churning? So there's like at the very bottom of all of these goals, there's still alignment on what the business is trying to do. Um, and I think from a, a shared goal perspective is if you don't have them with the departments today to create the relationships to build out that co-collaboration of who is responsible for what. So if we're building this new thing, then CS is responsible for gaining adoption. How can we help each other? Because yeah. we both own this goal. It's not if it wasn't adopted, CS is is in trouble, or if it wasn't built, products in trouble, or wasn't built right, products in trouble. I think there can be a lot of negative. Uh, who owns this like separately? But if you co-create it together and say, how do we work as teammates to for this to get built and for this to get adopted? Now you're you're working together in the same direction rather than each of you are owning something that feels so separate, but really below it, it comes from the same core value. Yeah, I love that. Go ahead, Mikhail. Sorry. I was going to say something. I love that. Um, and there's there's different ways to apply a strategy towards that at different levels of the organization. You can do it from a metrics perspective. You can do it from uh, whether it's your OKRs or you use a different particular model for your goal setting practices as an org. There are different ways at different levels to communicate that vision that there is more in common here than we're opposed to. Our goals are different methods of getting the same end result. So it's just the details that have to be worked out. But a quick story here. Um, a while back, I was at a company that did monthly recurring sales. So we had everything was MRR and it was a challenge to get the right customers over from sales to the CS team. And for those customers in the early stage to stick around and renew. We were having a churn problem where, Andrew, your face will fall. Customers would churn in their month three. Ouch. Ouch, right? Big problem. Yeah. And so part of solving the collaboration challenge, which is part of why all these things end up failing and building this experience that customers do not want to stick with, was setting at the highest level that we needed to keep a good, solid understanding of our core business functions and metrics. And one of those was lifetime value to customer acquisition costs. Or the other way around. So CAC to CLTV. Yeah, yes. To C uh, yeah, to CLTV. So it was critical for our sales team, for example, to understand they have to pick customers that would stick around three years, for example. And the right. CSMs are looking to keep a customer for at least three years. And that the product has to be sticky enough for at least three years. And it helped us focus on the longer term vision and course correcting what was most important versus what was distracting or confusing or being sold incorrectly, et cetera. And I, the thing I'd ahead, add Josh. to this is yeah. a lot of times in leadership, especially middle management, right? We're stuck in this arena where we are, we are competing against our peers across multiple departments. We're all hearing a similar message from executive leadership, and we're needing to translate that down to our, our teams respectively. And what often happens is we get this or not and mentality um, where it's our it's our ideals, our goals or nothing instead of it's our goals and their goals at the same time. So something, Ju Judith, that you said is that that we need we can have com uh, concurrent goals at the same time. They're still valid, still worthwhile, still going to get some support. Now we need to as leaders, we need to try and communicate where the inner inner connection actually works rather than setting ourselves up as the us versus them mentality. Well, I think that, I mean, this this all goes back to creating this culture where every department prioritizes customer success and and yeah. you know not just not just customer facing teams and even even other customer facing teams outside of customer success. Don't like like what you the the example that you gave Mikhail about, hey, you know, we got to pick the right customers are going to stick around long enough and here's yeah. why. Right, so just like we need to explain this this stuff to our folks, to to our team members of why these things are important, I think it's important that we're explaining to other teams because if they're they're not figuring it out, we need to be the ones that step up and explain. Hey, let me explain to you why this is important. Let me explain to you why we need these types of customers or why setting this type of expectation is not going to help us. Because you created this situation where we now have to reset expectations and then there's FUD and and it makes it harder to drive adoption and blah, blah, blah. And we're spending all this extra time and effort and you spell that out for them. 
that was something I had to do multiple times with multiple sales teams. Hey, listen, you, you need to adjust your messaging because what's happening here is my team is spending a lot more time kind of getting our customers back on track because expectations weren't set correctly instead of going out and doing even better things with the customers that are on track. Yep. Right. So you're, you're, you know, these types of things are having a negative impact and you have to do it in the right way too. You have to do it in a way that is respectful, that is not accusatory, that isn't, you're not trying to point. So it's a, there, there's a lot of nuances there. It's a delicate and, balance, right? I'm going to call you out for your bullshit, but I'm going to yeah. do it in, with a smile on my face and I'm going to hand you a freaking puppy while I'm doing it. Right. So it's a, it's a lot of, it's, it's an act, it's a juggling act, but nobody's going to do it unless we do it. In customer yep. success and and with the high EQ the customer success teams and leaders uh are you know typically possess, we're actually in the best position for that. I would and also add to you can make it so it's so relevant to them because yes, it affects us and another person can choose to care about that or not, right? Most people are very like they do care. I'm just saying like you can make anything that affects customer success, it affects the rest of the company. So when you sell customers like this, we lose out on references because we don't have good references to give you when a customer's on the fence. Right. And I also when you, you sell to the wrong fit customer, it's yeah. going to take longer. You're going to have a lot more pushback. I'm going to give you an ideal profile that we've seen success with. You can run with that and get well ahead of your number if you focus on the right customer. So not only is it affecting our teams. We have to reset expectations, but it's going to affect you later this year when you need a reference for a certain type of customer, or when you're working eight really hard deals, when you could be working uh, 15 really easy, faster, better deals that will then also become references. Well, in part, that that's their with them, right? That's the what's in it for me. This is mm -hmm. once again, part of the same shit that we should be doing with our customers, right? So this shouldn't be this shouldn't be foreign to anybody. And this is part of understanding your colleagues to understanding these, these folks in these other organizations you, that you depend on. It's the exact same motions, tactics, skills that you're using with your customers. I think I say it almost on every webinar that I'm a part of with you, Andrew, and you're going to get tired of me saying this, but it's not my job to force people to drink. It's my job to make people thirsty, right? right. So when I am trying to get collaboration to happen, I have to give them a reason why they should collaborate with me. And that is whether it's a customer, whether it's a peer in the different department, whether it's my team members themselves, I have to make people want to participate with me. So you've driven me to drink is what you're saying. Is that what it is? Is that why yes. I got a bottle of whiskey right over here? <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's take some questions. All right. Let's take some questions from, uh, from our patient and engaged audience. Um, and once again, to my guests, you see anything, any questions on that list that you, you know, something you want to jump in on right out, right out of the bat, hit that, uh, that answer live button. Uh, so our first question comes from Candace. Candace, thanks for joining us today. And we touched on this a little bit. Let's see if we can expand on it. How do you effectively collaborate with the sales team to ensure that expectations are clear about the product? So when the customer comes to CS, there aren't any surprises. I've never, never experienced something like this my, myself. Um, uh, I, I did a lot of, uh, kind of these validation checks with, with my sales team when I would, they would send something over. I'd at the next sales meeting, I would sit down and say, Hey, let me explain to you why, what you guys are saying here isn't helping us. Right. So it's a lot of that, a lot of that communication. Um, what about, uh, what about, what about the rest of you? I probably have a slightly different opinion on this, right? Because mm -hmm. Having worked in a business where sales, well, let, let me let me take the context away for a second, right? Sales has a job that they need to do. They need to accomplish something in terms of bringing the business in and making sure that we are getting customers to fill up that pipeline and to actually grow the business, all that sort of stuff. I have switched a little bit where I believe that if we are adding too many barriers to sales actually selling shit, then we are creating a, a situation for our own selves, especially in a market where if sales misses their number, CS gets cut. I, I can't put so many barriers in place that is going to cause them to miss their numbers. 
That said, I do believe in having some level of qualification for deals that come in so that we get to that ICP, so that we get to best fit customers, so that we can have the best sort of product outcomes uh, that, are, that are being sold. But we can't lose sight of the fact that sales needs to hit their numbers and have some empathy towards what the sales team is trying to accomplish. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I agree with you. But like you said, I mean, there's, I, we're, we're, I don't, I don't look at it as putting barriers up. I look at it as just kind of, kind of massaging the message a little bit. Sure. You know, uh, conveying oh, to them, you know, the, the, the consequences of, setting that inappropriate expectation, helping them understand what that is and maybe suggesting a different way of approaching it. It's a value proposition, a value yeah. sale. Sorry, mm -hmm. Mikhail. No, it's Go okay. Ahead. My ability to read people's faces and judge the right moment on Zoom is awful and it will always be. Uh, it's going to add some color here. So a story I was recently in an offsite with our sales team for their strategy and happened to be in the city, wasn't going to be invited beforehand speaking to collaboration, but got invited as the only person outside of the sales team to join the sales leadership strategy offsite. And in this meeting, it was me listening and them talking and working through things and contributing as we could. And the critical things were not, this was a bad deal and this was a bad deal and this was a bad deal and here's all the things going wrong. But it was to say, all right, Let's look at the questions sales is trying to tackle. They're trying to tackle, how do we close faster? They're trying to tackle, how do we get through objections better? They're trying to tackle, what objections can we never seem to beat? And we were able to provide some interesting insight that came directly from our post-customer, post-sale experience they hadn't heard of before. They were like, oh, interesting, I could try that. So we have to approach it as sales is our customer, not our enemy. And not even necessarily just this peer that we're working with internally. Think of them as your customer. Their objectives for this purposes have to be your objectives. But you can gently provide guidance that helps them solve their core problems. Ultimately, that will help solve your problems too. I love that. Yeah, they are definitely, the sales is not the enemy. They are doing exactly what we hire them to do. Mm -hmm. This is really, and it's not, it's not to stop them. It's not to put blockers in. It's really just to kind of help them hone their approach. There's a comment yeah. there. Do no, no harm in taking the crap. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> you got you got anything to add, Judith? I was just going to add. I, I saw in the Q and A, uh, sales folks are lying to close deals, or you know, faster and doing whatever they can to close deals. And I've been in in sales before, and I think that perspective is a failure on all cl cross collaborations. Why do they need to lie to close deals? Is it because the product? isn't delivering what it needs to deliver to actually close the deals. And then uh, eventually it will show up in the balance sheet when these customers do churn. And so there is some higher level cross collaboration, not just the sales leadership, but the product leadership and the CS leadership and potentially the support leadership, depending on where the issue is arising, where this isn't just a sales problem. They're lying to close deals because they can't close them otherwise, or they don't understand the product and they don't understand how to position it and who the right customer is. So they don't need to do that. And typically what I've seen is usually it's not even lying. It's misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding, lot of people are telling exactly. something that they don't yep. quite understand. So, but if we do feel like sales is saying things to close deals, what are they having to say? Because that should be the top concern. Is our product meeting the market where it's at today, if they're selling to the right people and they're selling to the right organizations, but they're not saying things that the product actually does very well, that should be escalated because that affects the long-term viability of the organization. So I think that's just a great example of even sales needs to be supported cross-functionally. Otherwise, they can't meet their goals as well. Yeah, that, that's that's what I found. I've been doing this a long time. I mean, and I've worked with tons of tons of sales teams and hundreds of salespeople and 99 times out of a hundred, nobody is intentionally lying. Right. And yeah, they're doing, they're trying to do unnatural things to close deals or, you know, it's early stage and they're making some commitments based off of what somebody in product told them, but we have no choice because we need the revenue to, to be able to drive, you know, continue to drive product development and stuff like that. 
Or if they're know, thinking in the future of potential growth from this customer that's buying at this stage, right. but they're looking at a, a path moving forward and that's just a communication gap potentially. It's a commun- but- well, it's a communication gap, but it's also the, you know, those types of situations absolutely require a conversation with the folks in the post sales that say, yep. Hey, you know what? We're making this these we promises. Think, We're yeah. making these commitments. We want you to be aware of them. I mean, right. I've been in situations where somebody threw something over and, and didn't even set that context. I'm like, we can't do this shit. Right. We can't do this. This is not possible. We didn't have a conversation ahead of time, right? So it totally, you know, threw me for a loop. Um, but yeah, most vast majority of the time, it's like, hey, listen, the way you said that, really, the, the product doesn't really work that way. And here's why. And here's how I would approach it differently, right? We can still get to the end game, but you know, you you've set an expectation where the customer thinks that they're going down this path, and really, the the path is very different. We'll still get to what they need to get to, but it's you know that right there. Just having, t- we can still get to the end end goal, but different paths can cause a lot of challenges yep. when you're trying to onboard a customer because they've got their mindset. Okay, this is how it's going to be. And I'll add one thing: if you've ever told a customer or not customer sales, if you've ever told sales, uh, just like Andrew just said, this thing isn't quite how it works. It works this other way. Here's what I'd advise. And the vibe you get back is cool. That sounds like a problem for you, right? If you get that vibe back from sales, that sounds like your problem later. You've got to figure out how to show them that it's their problem right now. Yes, 100%. So what do they care about and why is it their problem right now? And if incentives, for example, are not set up to support that, have discussion with sales leadership about that. If, If they're incentivized to do behaviors that don't make sense for the long term, then that has to change at a leadership level. And, and that, I, I that, even... that, that's typically where my, you know, if I have that conversation with a sales rep and I say, here's, mm-hmm. and, and they give me that kind of attitude, that's when I go above their head and say, hey, listen, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to help your team, but here's, yeah. here's what was, I was told, I told them, and here's what was said back to me, and we need to fix this. And probably a simple thing that we can do as leaders, especially in customer success, is go sit in on some sales calls periodically. Um, go sit and listen in on what's actually being said in real time. Go to the sales enablement trainings um, when you go to kickoff. Go to the the sessions that they're learning about how to talk about these things so we can provide our input on what we're seeing after the sale. Because a lot of times after the sale, it's too late anyways. That was was standard operating procedure for my team, especially when I had um, uh, practice managers that would work for me that are responsible for, you know, or engagement managers or, or, or customer success managers that, that are being introduced. I'm, I, I'd insist on it. Yeah. Uh, I'd insist on, on somebody sitting in and just listening. Uh, so awesome. Candace, thanks for the question. Our next question comes from Stevie. Stevie asks, thank you for joining us, Stevie. Thanks for the question. Stevie asks, can the panel share some prescriptive strategies for creating more intentional cross team touch points. I've certainly been guilty of having the recurring meeting to check the box, but want to be better. Josh looked like you want to, you want to jump in on this right out of the gate. So what yeah, have you got I've, for Stevie? I've talked about a couple of these things, but there's some very simple things, right? So uh, for sure, being more proactive about jumping into calls, especially with sales, uh, putting agendas out there, putting some specific details about what we're going to talk about. Like, at the end of the day, what we need to do is 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 create the expectation that I am going to have interest in your business at some level or another, right? And that means that I am going to purposefully schedule time on my calendar for you and I as you as a product manager, you as a sales leader, you as a support manager, you as a marketing manager. We're going to sit down and talk through what's working on a quarterly basis, what's working on a monthly basis. And those conversations are going to generate some sort of actionability. So if, and, and simple things, right? Like if you're a, your meeting doesn't have an agenda and if it doesn't have expected outcomes that you're going to get out of it, surprise, surprise, the things that we do with our customers, we're not going to get change to happen within the organization because we're not putting intentional uh, weight behind those things. So we got to ask questions from the right people and do it with an expectation that there's some there's going to be some change towards the better that's going to happen as a result of those conversations. I love that. I've actually coached people to actually decline meetings where there's no agenda yeah. or purpose listed. And I'm like you you need to you need to decline that until they can specifically tell you why you need to be there and what you're going to be talking about. 
Yep. I'll add Love one that. more thing just yes, to this. Mikhail. I was a company that tried an experiment for a month um, where we shortened all our meetings like a lot. And we said, write as much as we possibly can into this prep doc. And then we read it briefly. And then the meeting is only to discuss really key critical highlighted points. And the goal was to put a lot more of the prep and writing and a lot less going in circles and meetings. It's a very interesting exercise. Long term, you can't do every meeting in like 15 minutes. That's possible. But the lesson learned from that was to Josh's point, the more that we prepare beforehand, that can sometimes take the place of all the ideas we come up with. Yeah. We can come up with ideas for let's make client Slack channels or let's make a recurring every two weeks meeting or let's have this email thread we send. All of those are just tactics, but the most important underlying skill is preparation and clarity. And all that stuff, honestly, it, like it's the minutia that sucks so much because like yeah. you're you're doing all the little things to try and get to some sort of change, but the little things are what matter in the long run. It's the minutia that builds the monuments. It's the specificity. I like that a lot. And I something I've started to try to do is just keep a running list of the paper cuts. And then zoom out of those and say, what are the themes that I'm seeing and yeah. how can I bucket them? And now let me go prep that cross-functional person that I'm meeting with on a monthly basis or bi-weekly and say, here are the buckets and the things. And then you can actually get to, all right, let's get to a solution. Let's solve for these. But if you're having a check-in, that's like, how have things been going? You're going to have recency bias. You're going to say pretty good, I guess. So some of it is our own record keeping. And I've also struggled with like, I run into a paper cut. I'm going to go solve that right now in Slack yeah. and do all of that versus let's take it back. Let's bucket it. And now let's be really methodical with our approach to solve it at the higher level with all of the supporting data rather than a gut feel during that, you know, bi-weekly sync of how are things going? Cause that I actually have a couple of those things right now. So this is changing my mindset of, all right, what can I do Good. better? <laughs> uh, just a reminder, by the way, we're, we're going to be keep going here for another 15 minutes. So if you can stick around with us, we're going to continue answering questions stevie thanks for the question josh if you could hit the done button for me oh yeah next question comes from reggie uh reggie asks how early would you recommend customer success be involved cross-functionally in the process of creating providing a solution to a customer uh looks like mikhail you wanted to jump in on this my, yeah. my, res my yeah. response is the typical consultant response. It, it, it depends, but it sounds like you got, you've got, you've got an idea. I think it's, um, it, it's a really interesting question because less, yes, like you said, there's, it depends. There's no one answer of every CS team should always be involved early on in every deal. That's not the case. And in a lot of cases, having the CS team involved in the deal is not that helpful. Bogs you down takes a bunch of time, doesn't always help close the deal. So the critical thing is closing gap. So I would start with the sales team understanding from listening to calls in Gong, for example, or elsewhere, what are the moments where you as a CS leader can listen to those and go, oh, gap right there, something goes wrong, missed opportunity, phrased incorrectly. And it really goes back to providing information and then asking the sales team, according to this, and the value I provide as a CS leader or my CSM provides, here's what I think I can do. What do you want me to do? And just start somewhere. And the key is more the preparation and ongoing communication than whether or not you're involved in every deal and when exactly and all of that. I would say, last bit on this, though, the high level answer is that you want to bring CS in when they'll provide value. Either value internally, they're going to be supporting your sales team because they lack some sort of knowledge or guidance or phrasing, or to the customer directly where you're providing trust and illustrating, for example, typically the CS program and how that's a differentiator for your company versus a competitor. I have never, ever been in a situation where a customer said, I don't want the person who's responsible for making your promises into <laughs> reality not to be introduced until after I sign my contract. Uh, I have seen from a customer's perspective, and once again, I've been doing this a long time, even before SaaS was a thing. From a customer's perspective, having the people engaged that are going to be responsible for making the promise into reality early on is something that they appreciate and typically something that sales, for some reason, uh, finds uh, uh, offensive. 
think it's mostly a sales is worried you're going to say something they can't um, handle. You know, they're going to throw out some negative information by accident or right, ask right, a question. Yeah, because so, yeah, we don't because we don't want to have that customer sign so that we can keep our jobs, right? I know it's 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 an it's an irrational response. I mean, I always when I stepped into a room with with prospects and they said, "Oh, this is the person responsible for making our promises into reality," it, it completely changed the, their demeanor. They're like, "Oh, this person's going to tell us the real deal. They're gonna they're gonna make sure that everything that's being said is 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 uh, uh, on the mark." Uh, and and if anything, and I had my, uh, you know, luckily I had my share of, of sa sales reps that uh, viewed my involvement in the latter stages of the sales cycle uh, to be more than beneficial. It actually helped them push them across the line. So. Excellent question. Anybody else have uh, anybody else want to add to to Reggie's question? Judith, Josh. I was just going to plus one and say I think that. Um, when I was in sales, I usually brought in implementation partners at the end because there's a feeling when you're getting to that point where someone needs to sign that they're nervous and they're afraid and they don't want to make a bad decision. So yeah. when you pull in a team member that shows them that there's support and there's a way forward, I do think it accelerates the deal significantly. Um, I think that that can be really helpful to show how CS can partner with sales. Now, if CS is going in a call and early and then, you know, absolutely blowing up the deal because we don't do anything in AI and the salesperson just said AI, that's something that should be discussed as a path forward and kind of, again, a larger leadership type of conversation. But our involvement in sales is honestly for the customer to feel safe and ready to take that next step rather than a, a coaching opportunity for the sales rep. And if it becomes something that you're hearing, that's just a totally separate cross collaboration piece entirely than where we can be helpful. Well, that's something session. you got to take offline and you got to go yeah. have a discussion. Yeah. Let, I'll never let forget that be said and then clarify afterwards and, you know, exactly. get through that in, in an appropriate way. I, I'll never forget the experience I had. I got on a, uh, we were going out to visit a, um, a company that was buying our CRM system. And this once again, long, long before SaaS. So on-prem CRM installation. And, uh, I got pulled in very late into the deal. We were going out to do a demo of a system. So back in the day, you'd have, you, you'd create a custom demonstration to, to be able to show, okay, see, we can do what you want to do. Um, and I was handed the RFP response as we were by the sales rep, as we were getting on the plane to fly out to Colorado to meet with this prospect. And during the flight out, I read through the, the RFP response and we got off the plane and I turned to the sales rep and I said, like, I said, 80% of the response in here is bullshit. We can't do this stuff. And she just looked at me and said, okay, just don't say anything, you know? <laughs> and, and it, and it, what it, what, what it created was a real, it was such a problem. It was such a significant miss that, when we were bought by a larger company about six months later, it was one of those material things that we had to actually uh, uh, communicate as part of the deal because we were so, we were like, it was like a million and a half, $2 million in free services. So we actually had to notify the acquiring company. Um, so not, not a great, not a great situation. Um, Next question, also from Stevie. Thank you, Stevie, for, for another question here. What are some red flags of poor collaboration? How do you coach to an individual who may be harming a collaborative culture? I think we touched on a few of those already. Um, Josh knows I have an example of this. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll add a few things here. Sometimes okay. collaborative culture is just out of reach for an individual because they're burnt out because they've seen so many examples over their time of lack of collaboration that even if they have the instincts to get there they're just like it's impossible here no one wants to right we've all experienced that team member or team or culture where that's in place and there's a couple questions in the q a that kind of lead this direction when you're whether this is you're new to a team or you have a team member 
who you've inherited or not, who's really burnt out and not collaborative, or there's been M&A activity and you are being acquired, all of those cases, it's about building a safety, um, a, a, a culture of psychological safety to be vulnerable. Because that team member who is reluctant to collaborate, they don't want to be wrong. They don't want to fail. They they don't want to be perceived as creating more problems than whatever there is already there. So a key thing I've taken is anytime I'm inheriting or bringing on a new team and trying to help everybody kind of find a healthy spot is to be meeting one-on-one and understanding those individual team members' perspectives. What have they experienced? What are they burnt out on? What are they frustrated by? But also, what are they really good at? And just challenge each of them to find what they're already good at, who they can collaborate with, and figure out what are they doing really well, and then replicate it just a little bit further. So I'll let other people jump in, but this is an active problem I am facing. (laughs) I think red flags specifically that I've seen um, has to do with, I'll I'll call it a myopic sense of self-worth and self-importance, right? When, when you get to a certain point in your career where your perspective, where your perspective is not on the good of the business or the good of the department or the good of the role, and rather on the good of your own sense of wanting to be comfortable. I think so the, that tr- that's, the trough of disillusionment, is, yes. I believe, is what it's referred to. Yes, exactly. I think that's probably the biggest red flag. And it starts showing up in the, in small, simple things, right? It's the lack of an agenda. It's the lack of paying attention. It's it's being distracted. It's not showing, not putting any input. It's showing up to a meeting and not being on camera. It's little stuff, right? That can be misconstrued for, um, oh, that's just the way that they are. Oh, that's just a little bit of burnout. Oh, they're just tired or they're whatever, right? If you find yourself making excuses for um, potentially bad behavior, and each each company culture is going to be different, right? So it's going to depend on your company culture and the expectations that you have. But I think that those red flags are things that as a leader, we need to be aware of and try to find out just like we do with our customers, right? Why is a customer not engaging? What is it that's happening on their side that's potentially causing them to pull away from us and not wanting to get onto a call, right? The same thing happens with our employees, with our team members, with our peers. So we need to... Um, start trying to figure out how to engage them differently and give them incentives for uh, what they're going to do. All that said, there are some points at which we have to, you know, make the hard call and say, there's a performance issue here. There needs to be some change in behavior. There needs to be a change in attitude. And not every every person is worth salvaging if they're going to be toxic to the overall team. So... I, I would say that those red flags are not ones that you you can ignore. You have to step in and, and figure them out. Just like with customers, no news is not good news. With employees, with team members, with peers, uh, a lack of engagement is not a good, it's not a good, good. sign. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again, Stevie, for, for the question and for joining us today. Our next question comes from Megan. Megan, um, Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the question. Our sales are down, which has increased the number of lies, things we don't offer at all, or things we offer on higher plans being sold, on lower plans, or personal promises being made. We've brought up the concern to every level of sales leadership and are either ignored, gaslighted, or told we'll address that, but nothing changes. Our churn rate is abysmal, at least 60% due to these lies, yet no one seems to be as alarmed as we are. How can we prove how sales actions are contributing to harm to all of us, our business, our teams, our customers? Wow, Judith, you want to you wanna weigh into this one. All right, go for it. Um, I, we talked about it a, a little bit before, but I do think that, you know, sales leadership, dismissive, that's not a great sign, but the health of the business is at risk. And that I think that's where it's like we all go down to the same roots. If we're selling customers that don't renew, then we're not going to grow because, and that's what a lot of organizations are looking to do is to continue to grow, et cetera, et cetera. And if you lose customers, that's not possible. So there's not a great, here's a, here's an answer, but I would look at the strategic high levels 
of, hey, I have financial implications for our organization. I've looked through what the churn rate is. What that means, we're going to have to double sell next year. Quotas will need to be doubled in order to make up for all of the churn that you've seen. Those are things, no one wants their quota to be doubled, right? There's a lot of downstream impacts that if you are a sales leader at this organization, you don't want to see next year is to have bigger numbers because all of the customers that you sold to last year churned. So even if you did the same thing next year, you would have to do double to make the actual growth goals. So there's financial revenue implications. If you're not getting that response from this particular sales leaders, I'd look at your you know, CRO if you have one. I'd look at your CEO because that's the strategic direction of the organization. And then I think long term, it's a shared, it's a shared responsibility. These churn metrics, if you're being held accountable to these churn metrics, that's out of your control, right? So saying, hey, I want to have direct ownership that sales is held accountable, has some sort of compensation incentive for customers that last longer than 13 months or however it makes sense with your contracts. But work on A, pointing out the financial implications as an organization to the right leadership and then B, coming up with a mutually accessible goal that you can work on together so that it doesn't happen again next year. I, and I want I to think, add one, oh, sorry. No, go for, go for it. it. All right, one small comment. It's an additional, it's just a practical strategy because um, Judith, fantastic answer and, and folks who chimed in in the Q&A, uh, that company I mentioned a little bit earlier, right, with the three months in charge of those customers, that company doesn't exist anymore. So I've faced this problem very personally before. And one additional tactic or strategy to ask is when you talk with your C-levels, look to understand their objectives. So this isn't just, ooh, 60% churn is bad, but why is that bad right now? So think their level, are they Series A in investment, VC funded looking to go to Series B? That's a story change. You raise differently at Series B than you do on Series A. So your fundamentals have to be in a better place than before. So align it to the very highest level objectives. Are you trying to be acquired? Are you trying to raise funding? Are you trying to get profitable? Are you trying to change your core staff? Bring it all the way to the very top, because if you need your sales leadership to buy in and they're gaslighting you, hopefully your very top won't. Yep. So. And, and I would add one other thing is, um, this is just practical as well, right? Don't just come with the, with the problems come with a potential solution around what do we think could be fixed, right? And it's not always just on sales, right? I know it's easy to blame sales for certain things, but like, what are the things that we could potentially implement as a business, as a whole team to potentially solve this? Because, you know, Judah said it earlier, churn is not just a CSM problem not just a sales problem. It's a company-wide problem, which is why when you go to executive leadership and say, here's what we're dealing with, here's the things that I'm finding, the facts are the facts, but there's also going to be some solutions for it that you can work through and don't just bring, don't, don't just be the uh, the bell ringer on things. We did a, we did a commission holdback. We, we would, uh, uh, in, so we, I had, I had this problem before and what we did is we said, listen, you, you're going to get, <laughs> you know, X percent of your commission uh, upon contract signature, but then I, I think it was half of it, half of it on contract signature, but the rest on go live or the rest on, after six months, right? Uh, that way you, you I mean, if you, you, there's the carrot and then there's the stick, right? The carrot is don't sell bad deals. Don't make, don't make shit up to close, to line your pockets. They're actually, these are, these are, when the salespeople do that, they're not only causing a, a lot of problems to the post sales team, um, but uh, they're also basically robbing the business. They are taking money out of the business's pocket because they're making shit up so that they can line their pockets. They can hit their goals, which means they hit their commission. They hit their variable component. So, um, and with that, we're at the end of our time for today. Uh, I think it was a great conversation, but what's, it's not what I think. It's not what we think. It's what all of you think. So please let us know by posting your feedback on LinkedIn and either tagging uh, myself or our guests or success hacker or success coaching. I want to thank our guests for speaking, spending the time with us uh, and for the ideas, thoughts, insights, and best practices that you shared. Uh, one final note, great CS leaders know they don't have all the answers, but they know where to get them. And that's why we created the CS Leadership 
roundtable to harness the knowledge and experience of the community to help improve everyone. Once again, we hope to see you next month on September 11th, when we'll discuss how customer success teams can leverage data analytics to make informed decisions. Until then, make sure to make space for yourself and your mindset every single day and have a great rest of your week and month, everybody. See you next time.